In a lot of the behind the scenes shots from Avatar The Way of Water, you'll see these monitors. Zoom in and you'll see the performance of the actor playing Quaritch, a nine foot tall Navi. The robotic monitor was a reference for the actor in the scene and for the VFX team who added the CG giant in post. It was a huge step forward from the first Avatar, which only had a handful of scenes with humans and Navi interacting compared to the sequel. Filmmakers have been making actors taller or smaller than they really are for over a century. But making sure the scale is realistic without ruining the illusion is where the real work begins. And one of the pioneers in the space is Weta, the visual effects company that's overseen some of the most groundbreaking CG characters of all sizes in movies like The Lord of the Rings and The Way of Water. We always have to play games in film to make that feel and actually be able to get good performances from the different scale that you want. If they're six foot, the tree's gonna need to be 30% smaller if the characters are gonna be 30% bigger. So there's a lot of planning involved there. It's a puzzle filmmakers have been trying to solve since the invention of film. Take this shot of 1909's Princess Nicotine. The tiny fairy next to this normal-sized human was actually standing on a platform far behind the table. This is known as forced perspective, in which one performer in frame will place themselves closer to the camera and the other farther away. Forced perspective requires a sharp depth of field so both the foreground and background appear equally in focus. And that means a lot of light. Visual effects artist Peter Ellenshaw said that when working on 1959's Darby O'Gill and the Little People, the production used so many lights for the forced perspective shots that it blew out the circuit breakers at a nearby power station. Forced perspective works when the characters are separated. When they have to interact, things get more complicated. This was an issue Peter Jackson encountered when he started shooting The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring with wizards, dwarves, and hobbits. To expand how scale could be used in these movies, the crew had to manipulate their sets and props while filming at just the right angle. Here you can see Gandalf and Frodo sitting side by side. All right then, keep your secrets. But on set, Elijah Wood was sitting on a shorter stool pushed farther back while Ian McKellen sat right in front of the camera. These sorts of raised sets are a common forced perspective technique that you can also see two years later in Elf. And forced perspective also needs to be paired with props that are made to scale. In this shot, Frodo and Gandalf were actually sitting at a table that had been split apart. On one side were normal sized props for Frodo, and for Gandalf, a small scale table with a mug that was two thirds the size. The reason these forced perspective shots work is that the camera stays still. Most of the camera moves were quite locked off. Once the camera moves, the illusion is ruined. It's screwed with your head a little bit when you're on set because when you watched it from the side, it didn't look right at all. To accomplish this moving forced perspective shot, the crew placed the table on a moving platform and programmed the camera to move in the opposite direction. They programmed the camera's moves in advance, making them easy to replicate. That way, in scenes like this one, they could shoot the actors separately in the exact same way and seamlessly combine them. The shorter Bilbo could walk in front of the much taller Gandalf, and it could all be combined with the two versions of Bilbo's house, one hobbit-sized and one made 33% smaller for Gandalf. Oh! And these shots could consist of more than two characters at once. Nine companions. To get all four hobbits, two humans, a dwarf, an elf, and a wizard into the same shot, the crew filmed scale composites of each actor against a blue screen, with the proper framing and camera angle for the characters' heights. The images were then composited together. This technology continued to be perfected and used to expand the Lord of the Rings universe. But it hit a snag as Weta worked on Avatar and The Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey, two movies shot in 3D. A lot of the cheats we were able to get away with before, we can't get away with as much now. So instead of shooting with one camera, you're shooting with side-by-side -side cameras so you get proper 3D. The false perspective really falls apart quite quickly because you understand the depth of the shots. The motion control really kicked into gear for the Hobbit trilogy. At this point, the cameras were much more precise and reliable than they were in the original trilogy, like during this sequence. It got the results you needed. You were able to do camera moves you wanted. You were able to move around do the th different things you had to do to get the shots. But it can pose a challenge when the actors are playing non-CG characters. 
Because the actors were frequently shot in different takes to account for the differing heights, they weren't able to directly interact with one another. It wasn't very actor-friendly. Size manipulation is a lot easier if the character is fully CG, like the giant in the BFG played by Mark Rylance. Mark could be on set with actor Ruby Barnhill, as long as he acted above her on this platform. But even this movie innovated new riffs on past techniques. For example, Ruby was surrounded by oversized props when her character was in the giant's house. But unlike past large-scale props, some of them were blue. That way, the animators could add movements to this giant-sized squash. Some other tricks to maintain proper eyeline and sense of scale are low-tech, but effective. In the Avengers films, Josh Brolin plays the eight-foot-tall Thanos. The mocap sensors he wore were so good at picking up subtle expressions and movements that his real height didn't matter until he was interacting directly with other characters. So to fill out the height gap in this shot, Josh wore a cutout on top of his head so Robert Downey Jr. knew exactly where to look. You can also see the 5'4 Tatiana Maslany wearing a cutout here to look like she's the 6'7 She-Hulk. Just like in the BFG, she stood on an elevated platform in these shots and occasionally sat on a cushion. But eyeline isn't the only issue you need to resolve when making a performer taller. In this walking shot, She-Hulk isn't standing next to anybody, but Weta found another issue. Tatiana's real stride didn't match up with She-Hulk's much longer legs. Where Tatiana would take 10 steps, She-Hulk would take seven. That's where retargeting or character mapping comes in. This is when the VFX artists take all the movements and expressions from the performance capture cameras and apply them to the animated character. When the character is a different size, Weta's software nuance needs to fill in the gaps. Like in translating actor Sam Worthington's posture over his Navi body in Avatar. Or turning Andy Serkis into Caesar in the Planet of the Apes trilogy. And if he's quadrupedal, you want to make sure that what is absolute here from his performance is his two feet and the markers on the end of the arm extension. The crew worked with actor Malia Araya to retarget She-Hulk's stride. Malia could serve as a more height-appropriate stand-in, but this isn't a new practice. In the past, stand-ins were used in shots where you couldn't see their face. By having Malia's movements recorded on a mocap stage, VFX artists could map her stride along with Tatiana's facial capture onto She-Hulk. Everything about you is just working. Thank you. The better CG and camera tech has gotten, the more seamless these scale shots can be. For all of the technological breakthroughs in the original Avatar, there are actually very few shots of humans and Navi characters together, as the process at the time was much less precise. Take it easy, don't get ahead of yourself. For instance, the shot of Neytiri holding Jake Sully's human body was achieved by two green suit performers approximating Navi size. But that new eyeline system meant there could be many more shots of humans and Navi together. It consisted of a monitor playing an actor's previously recorded performance. That monitor was attached to overhead cables at four points. So whenever Scoresby had a scene with Quaritch, the monitor would play back Stephen Lang's performance at the proper height. It got rotations, it got height, so as he moved around, it knew exactly where his head was supposed to be, his eyes were supposed to be, and it moved around set. Take this shot, where Quaritch walks alongside two human-sized characters. We had a live-action character, Kevin Dorman, actually walking beside them. Kevin Dorman is the easy one, right? He's just live-action character walking on a construction set, but he has to match the speed of slang, which was performance capture. So we take the performance capture, and we put it on the cable cam, the eyeline system, and we actually ran that down the construction set, and Kevin Dorman was able to walk along with him, and he had an eyeline, so he knew the speed he was supposed to walk. But it wasn't just the actor who needed precise references. Real-time depth compositing allowed James Cameron to see the CG performances as the footage was being captured. By seeing a rough version of what the finalized CG shot would look like, the director could better set up shots of CG and live-action characters without worrying about a single camera move ruining the illusion. Weta also used real-time compositing on the first Avatar, but the traditional combining of CG and live-action footage is typically done in layers. Back in the day, you sort of had an A over B, which meant you had either the live action or the CG, and it was one over the other. 
The new system built for the way of water looked at each shot's elements in pixels instead of layers. We wanted to place the depth of each pixel as we were shooting so that instead of doing A over B, we could take each point on space and say you're either in front or behind the other character. And that helps achieve the correct scale. You could actually see how big someone was because otherwise you're just getting that fake perspective even inadvertently because a character is always over the top of one another. Thanks to all of Weta's innovations, making a character look bigger or smaller is no longer a guessing game. Those perspectives can be less forced. But even in the completely CG Pandora, some of the most convincing scale illusions are tangible. Like when Quaritch holds up his own human-sized skull. On set, there was an actual prop skull, but scaled down from human size. That way, the actor's hand looked Navi-sized. When he crushes it, it feels like a normal-sized skull because you never think about his hand being a small, normal-sized hand. You just assume it's the Navi's hand crushing it because you go from a shot of slang to a hand and your brain just fills it in as just a big hand instead of a painted smaller hand. 